That's that the five boys. I want to get one more, then I'll have a hockey team. <laughs> <laughs> okay. A landscaping crew. I mean, get them out there in the summertime, shovel in the right. driveway. There you go. So good afternoon, everyone, or good evening. Um, so we have a pretty full agenda. So I'd say that we get going and we will try to do our best to kind of move things along. Uh, hopefully a number of these will be continued. So hopefully it's not quite as bad as it looks. Okay, so uh, welcome everyone. Today is April 14th, 2021. And this is the Amherst Conservation Commission meeting. So going through the agenda, I am first and I have nothing. So Dave, it goes to you. Sure, great. I'll be very brief because I know how heavy your agenda is tonight. But first, I wanted to welcome Erin back. It's so great to have her with us again in, in town hall. And uh, uh, there's a little bit of a little bit of backlog to catch up. But Stephanie did such a great job that I think the handoff has been pretty smooth. So uh, welcome back and congratulations to Erin on on the new uh, new addition to her family. So um, it's great to see her around town hall. Um, Couple of things going on out there in the field. Uh, we are working on proposals that will be coming before the commission um, in the coming in the coming weeks, I guess, in coming month or two. Uh, we're looking at um, in increasing and improving access to some of the conservation areas. In particular, um, I'm working with some staff on. Um, proposals for a new parking area at um, Sweet Alice Conservation Area on Bay Road. Also Catherine Cole and Podick out in North Amherst. And we'll have, uh, we'll have some plans coming to you soon on those. Um, uh, on the Hickory Ridge front, we are looking at a new closing date in August now. So that project is still alive and well, but um, the closing has been put off, but I had a good conversation with uh, both attorneys, the town attorney and um, the attorney for the sellers. And um, I think all is well. It's just uh, all about the solar, I should say, all about the solar. Um, what else is going on? Um, let's see. Um, I know that Aaron and I have had a couple of conversations about some minutes that uh, commission minutes and we're coming up with a plan. Uh, um, uh, unfortunately, we got a little behind on minutes, but uh, Aaron has kind of proposed a couple of ideas and I'm going to try to provide her with some support around the edges to get caught up on minutes. Um, those are important. They're, they're important for the record. Obviously, we have the, uh, we have the, um, the Zoom meeting uh, uh, recordings, but it's important to have minutes that you all have approved. So you'll be seeing minutes coming to you on a more frequent basis. Um, so right now, I think those are those are the the main things uh, that I'd like to to uh, just bring to your attention, and there'll be more coming in in the near future. Um, I probably won't be with you for the entire night tonight, but I'll try to stay as long as I can. I also wanted to say that I know Beth Wilson will be joining you later to talk about the Fort River, uh, excuse me, the Faring Brook project, um, and I'm continuing to work with the abutter to that project on access. Um, we need to access that property both for the Fairing Brook work as well as for the conservation area uh, access. And it's very clear we met with Stephanie and I met with our uh, town council, our town attorney a couple of weeks ago. It's, it's very clear that we have access, but in order to do some of the work necessary for the NOI, we'll need some permissions from, from the abutter and I'll be meeting with him soon. So I think we can secure those, those uh, uh, some additional access rights. So, hey, Aaron. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, Leroy is in the attendees um, bucket. Noticed. Sorry. Sorry, Dave. So no problem. Those are the quick uh, kind of around the around the horn updates uh, on things we're working on on the on the land management side. And so one quick question, Dave, is the new person who is helping out Brad? Is, I know he that person was selected. Are they have they actually started now? Yes, Brendan Kelly. Yes, he has started. Brendan has started. He's a couple of weeks in. He's from all reports I've gotten, and I've met with him once or twice. Um, you know, really a great addition to the team. I've asked Brad uh, to schedule a time through Aaron um, to come and and do kind of a reporting out, a summary of 2020, and then kind of a look forward for 2021. 
So I'm hoping that Brad will coordinate that with Aaron and get on your agenda for one of your upcoming meetings. And they'll do a nice PowerPoint of what's happening out there in the field. Um, um, yeah, we've had some great volunteer efforts this this pandemic. I mean, that's one of the you know the the positive um, side notes of the pandemic that we've had some people with a lot of time on their hands. So um, they've done some nice uh, trail clearing and um, uh, other other trail improvements. So um, yeah, I think Brad will have a full report on that. Excellent. Um, lots of trail use out there, you know, continues and, you know, it's just great to see everybody enjoying the out of doors right now. Yep. Thank you, Dave. Anybody have any questions or comments for Dave? Okay. Aaron, the floor is yours. So I'm just going to jump right into other business. Can you guys see my screen? Um, so one thing that you'll notice is a little different about this PowerPoint and also just as a, um, a quick note, Dave and I um, have been strategizing for me to try to share more information with you in advance of the meeting if possible, um, just so that, especially tonight, so we could move things a little faster, but also just in general. So one of the things I did was provide draft motions. And if that's something you guys like, then I'll continue to do that. Um, so the first one is um, the there was an emergency certification issued to breach the beaver dam at Podic Catherine Cole Conservation Area. This was also actually included in our order of conditions that was issued um, for the Eversource work that was proposed, but um, the emergency cert was issued. So if we got it covered twice from a regulatory standpoint, that's wonderful. So this is just ratifying that um, approval to breach that beaver dam and um, draw down the water because the beavers have been removed out there. And just to be clear here, Aaron, this implies that this has already been done. Correct. Yep. yep. Okay. Yep. Obviously a long-standing issue out there. Yep. So, um, I love I, I love your advanced brief, you know, PowerPoint. I love that. Oh good. Okay. Yeah, I, found that. Any, I found that pretty helpful, Aaron. Awesome. Well I'll definitely do that. I'll continue to do that then. That's some good That's type A stuff right there. So appreciate it. <laughs> okay, so anybody have any issues or comments regarding uh, Podic beavers? Okay, if not, looking for a motion. I move to um, certify the uh, emergency, ratify the emergency certification for Podic Catherine Cole. Second. Okay, voice vote. Fletcher. Aye. Larry. Aye. Anna. Aye. Jen. Aye. Laura. Aye. Leroy. Aye. And I for me as well. Next, Aaron. Okay, so um, there was supposed to be um, a request for emergency certification for seven pot line place. Um, we're going to table that to the next meeting. There was a, an issue on the site that I'm working with the um, applicant to correct. So um, that's why that's crossed off. Um, the next issue is um, in late 2019, we issued, this was I, my first meeting, we issued um, a certain, voted to approve a certificate of compliance for Eversource out on um, the um, Pomeroy court. They had put in a conduit um, and and I had gone out and done a site visit and everything was fine. And um, for some reason, the paperwork and I, I take full responsibility for it. They, they're saying they never got the certificate of compliance and I can't seem to locate it. So it's basically just a reissue of it with electronic signatures is all I'm looking for approval to do. Cool. That is easy. Any questions or comments? Okay, looking for a motion. I'm move to reissue the certificate of compliance for seven pot wine. Is that what it was? Seven pot wine? Um, Eversource oh. um, Pomeroy Court. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Eversource Pomeroy Court. Second. Okay. Voice vote. Laura. Aye. Aye. Larry. Aye. Anna. Aye. Jen. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Leroy. Aye. And I for me as well. Next, please, Aaron. Okay. Um, 
So the next is that um, the, the railroad um, has submitted a, an RDA application and um, under the RDA application, they've checked to confirm the boundaries for their five year um, management plan where they do spraying along the railroad tracks. Mm -hmm. And um, this, because it's an RDA, um, we don't, the state does not require abutter notifications for an RDA, but our bylaw does. Um, they're saying for the last 20 years, they have not been required to do abutter notifications and that previously um, Beth has not required them to do abutter notifications for this to basically just confirm the um, spray and no spray zones along the railroad tracks and they don't want to have to notify abutters for that. Um, I had talked with Dave about this and also Stephanie and um, I personally didn't feel comfortable waiving that requirement. And I told the applicant that Dave um, and Stephanie also said they didn't feel comfortable waiving that requirement. Um, so it's really a question of whether the commission is comfortable waiving the abutter notification requirement for that. Um, I can go into more detail, but I think maybe just start there and see what people's comfort level is. This was just, this was just for, to notify where the spray zone or no spray zone is? It's or just do you have to just notify everybody? It's just to confirm via um, a request for determination where the spray and no spray zones are. And that's, they use um, DEP wetlands layer. They also use wellhead protection zones, um, natural heritage layers and things like that to differentiate where the spray zones and no spray zones will be located for the entire right of way through town. How many people are involved in notifications? A lot. A I lot. mean, hundreds. Like a lot. A lot. Hundreds. Yeah, hundreds of abutters, and it's it's an RDA application. So, like with EverSource, when you know, I was trying to compare <laughs> apples to apples. It's a little difficult because, like, for for EverSource, it was a notice of intent, which requires abutter notifications, anyways. Um, this is an RDA, which under state they don't require a butter notification. Um, it's just under our local bylaw. So they're, they're thinking it's a little overkill just to confirm the boundaries of the spray zones to require that notification of hundreds of abutters. I mean, I can appreciate that it's a lot, right? And I think that if people are abutting this, they also have a right to understand when people are spraying um, next to their property in, this, in, the, in the potential wetlands. Like that seems clear to me. And I'm sorry that it's a hundred or hundreds of abutters. I understand that that's hard. And there's a reason why that bylaw exists. Yeah, so just so that you guys know, if they, if they dig in their heels and they say, no, we're not notifying the butters, mm -hmm. there's basically, um, we would still have to issue it. We would still have to hold the, he the meeting um, under Wetlands Protection Act and essentially confirm it through Wetland Protection Act. Um, but you guys would then deny it under the local bylaw, which they would have to appeal, I guess, in um, superior court or wherever they would go to, to battle, to fight that battle if they decide not to notify. Yeah, so does anybody remember the history? Um, so I'm looking at you, Fletcher, or maybe Dave. I don't remember. Um, how, I vaguely remember this coming how often before does it occur? How often does it occur? Every five years. Five years, okay. So that would be like just before... I let, I joined, probably you guys dealt with it. Yeah, I remember they offered us a ride on the choo-choo train, so. I mean, as fun as that sounds, I love a good train, but I mean, in five years, right? Like we're talking potentially new people in those houses. We're talking like there's- I think we just need to find out what's been done in the past. I think, I think it's, you know. Well, in the past they didn't need, they got a, they got a, a pass. Basically. Yeah. So it sounds like for the past 20 years, they haven't notified the butters. Did okay. I understand that correctly, Aaron? That that is what um, that is what they are saying, and um, have, they have did, there, sorry, they did send me um, an email from Beth that um, stated that she she verbally waived the requirement um, the last go round. But so yep. this is, I got the the email from him up on the screen, and it says in the past twenty years five filings we've not been required to notify butters. Yeah, I, I have no 
firm recollection either way. I do know that Beth is is on this call. Um, I don't want to put her on the spot. My, no. my sense is if if we didn't do it before, that was probably carried through, carried forward. I mean, Dave, have you had experience with um, abutters complaining about the railroad in this particular circumstance that you know of, remember? Um, to be to be honest, I've had more, we've had more experience, I think the town has with Eversource. Um, I don't know why that is. I'm trying to kind of visualize the Eversource lines, but I think, I don't, I don't, I, I think the spraying along the Eversource lines, the overhead lines is maybe just more obvious and people notice it more. I, I don't know. Um, I, I did get one complaint. Um, I want to say it was my within my first six months with the town. Um, somebody called or emailed me stating that they saw um, the railroad spraying out behind um, in the no spray zone behind the vernal pools in the center of Cushman. And, you know, it was one of those things where I got the email after the fact, and there was really no way for me to go out and confirm there was no photos provided. And what's been really tough is like, I didn't know who to contact with through the railroad to confirm, deny, you know, get any information. So it was kind of just a notification that I filed away, but I did get that. And again, there are some areas in that general vicinity of Henry Street where there is spraying allowed. Um, once you get beyond that sensitive area behind the vernal pools, it's there is a spray zone. So I'm not sure exactly where they were located, um, but for the record. I will, I mean, for I will say, I mean, if the bylaw says this, I mean, yes, there's, there's past practice, but you all yeah. You're your own commission today. I mean, you're you you're not necessarily bound by what a commission did 15, 20 years ago um, or five years ago. So I, I also think I don't know, Aaron, if you've if you've inquired with any other towns to see what they do. I mean, the railroad goes through dozens and dozens of towns. So do we know what you know other towns to our north or south uh, require? I. I don't, but what I can say is from the towns that I've worked in, it's very unusual to require a butter notifications for an RDA. Mm. Amherst is unique in that requirement. So I think right. other towns may have bylaws, but they just don't have, I mean, I would suspect that what the issue is is they don't have in their bylaw that it's required to notify a butters for an RDA. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I guess that technically this is a request for just demarcating the areas, not necessarily for doing the work. That's right. That's exactly correct. It's just to confirm the spray zones. And then when they actually right. do the work, though, that's going to require a NOI? No, I don't believe so. No. They're, they do a five-year veg management plan, just like okay. Eversource does. Okay. Um, and because they're considered to be... How do you tell uh, utility transportation um that's that's what they uh, the state um requires of them under the exemptions under the act okay so there's no additional oversight that we get after this then are yep. the spray zones demarcated in any other way sorry if i missed that but is there <laughs> um in any other way. I mean, are th there's not like signage or, or like spraying happening this weekend or whatever. Like there's no, cause I mean, this is my thought, right? Like if someone is like, if we're in this town and all of a sudden people are, are spraying and no one who is abutting that property knows why that feels like we messed up, right? And, and so for me, this is about, I mean, that sounds so cheesy but this is about being a good neighbor and, and being a part of the town and letting people know what you're doing. Um, I think for me that, um, yeah, I get, that's where I'm, I'm falling on it is, is they should, they should notify about us, um, that this is happening. Yeah. Well, and just, if you're living near a uh, long utility, I think you should also be expecting some sort of management. Yeah, that's kind sure, of, and that's you should know, but, but don't you think you should also know when it's going to happen, right? Like, I mean, that they're doing it or, and I don't know. I mean, yes, and I'm not sure that that's top of mind for everyone. They may not realize what management means. And this is not going to tell them that, though. No, it's yeah. not going to tell them when or anything like that. 
Right, well, but I mean, it's going to tell them that spraying will happen, right? At some point. Yeah. yeah. My, my, I, have a, I have a question. Um, it, it appears in reading that document that he that they sent and so forth, this that they're they're the idea of notifying relates to wetlands. And we're now talking about people that are also out of wetlands area. Mm -hmm. What's the distinction in terms of that? I mean, what I'm saying is, if there's a requirement relative to wetlands, that's one story. But if it's a requirement about notifying anybody about the spraying, is that within our, 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 our where we could deal with? We're that's, not, an, oh. that's an interesting question, Larry. It, um, it is a good question. Because <laughs> there, <laughs> and, it, and it kind of, it's like unpeeling an onion. In the act, there is there are provisions that in areas where work is being done, um, like a specific site, there can be different notification requirements. They did that. They did that change to the Wetland Protection Act, um, I believe, in 2016, um, as a way to address exactly what you're talking about. So, for example, the Eversource owns the the entire right of way. Let's say they're just doing a single structure replacement on one spot in the right-of-way, it would be absolutely ridiculous for them to notify everyone along the entire right-of-way of town to tell them they're replacing one structure. So what they did was they said, um, they added a, an additional provision that you could notify people within a thousand feet of that specific site for work like that. The difference here is we're dealing with these long stretches of right-of-way, which if we did that, it would be a thousand, within a thousand feet of those long stretches. And honestly, I don't think it would be any savings per se to, for example, be notifying fewer people in that instance. Um, I think it would still be large, incredibly large swaths of people. And actually I think it would even be capturing larger, potentially larger, um, a larger group of abutters that wouldn't otherwise be notified potentially if we did it that way. It's yeah. a tricky question. Yeah. <laughs> I and mean, I think once you're outside wetlands, you're outside our jurisdiction. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. right. right. Yeah. And they're not spraying in wetlands. Right. So, <laughs> so we're telling people where they're not spraying. We're not telling people where they are spraying that they're going to spray. Right. <laughs> and that would be a different commission. Uh, I, I no, they're utilities, so they don't they don't have to. I don't I don't have a solution to the RDA question, but I do wonder, Aaron, you know, and, and I don't recall whether Beth or Stephanie before her, but with all of our social media capabilities now at the town level, I'm wondering if regardless of how the commission sides on this or, or, or lands on this, you know, we certainly could publicize this on our website and through social media to try to get it out to as many people as possible to let them know just, you know, what, what the railroad does, um, what they're required to do. I mean, these maps are very helpful. You can kind maps of are very helpful. find yourself on the map. I know I, my backyard is a Eversource right of way. Right. So I knew when I bought the land that mm -hmm. they had an easement over my property and there's overhead wires there. So, um, but again, you know, it's not going to reach everybody. I, I recognize that, but it might be a way to at least get, get this information out there. And then if people have questions, they can either ask us or they can ask the railroad. And um, just to follow <laughs> up, dovetail what Dave just said, um, from my perspective, I think it's less important to notify abutters and more important for us to be certain what areas are in fact sensitive along this line. So if, if the commission did not, if the commission did allow um, a waiver, I would definitely highly recommend the commission get a second opinion on this um, as to what areas are in fact sensitive along this line. Um, that, that would be my recommendation anyways, pretty much because I was very unclear looking at this, like, what is this based on? You know, like wetlands, like, did they use USGS? Did they use, like, it's, it's just spray zone, no spray zone, you know, and to really zero in and say, are there larger areas that should be no spray zones along here? Um, 
I don't know. That, I just, that's, an in, that's an interesting um, take, Aaron. I suspect this is simply from a history of visual visual uh, inspection along the along the tracks. So it, it's an interesting idea is to say, you know, we would like somebody to go out with railroad personnel and go along the line and confirm that this map is actually accurate. Again, I have a vague recollection that Stephanie or Beth, you know, I, I even feel like I might have years ago gone out um, on the on the rail bed with them, but but I'm I'm a little fuzzy on that whether that that was for that purpose or not. But um, we might have been doing um, rail inspection for beaver uh, beaver impacts. But anyway, that, that's an interesting idea is to actually have them a somebody to go out and be be the eyes and the eyes of of the of the commission. So. And, and I'm not suggesting that that decision be rendered right now either, as far as like a, a board discussion. I'm just suggesting that if if the either way that that would be, I think, a good thing to do just to verify this. Do we have any record at all of where the delineation was about what areas they spray and what they don't? Do we have anything of that? You're, um, you're probably looking at it, Larry. Yeah, this it would be something very similar to what you're looking at right now. These maps where yeah, that, it's, that's their map. That's their map. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I, I'm pretty sure this was. There's no delineation. There's no wetland scientist who went out and confirmed this. This is done. I'm pretty <laughs> sure by just visually going along the tracks and saying, "Here's a wetland. Here's a stream." Um, yeah, I, I think it's. I think it's also just more like there's vegetation in the way, you know, like in wetland areas, the vegetation is not going to be as high unless it's like a red maple swamp. I don't know. Well, well the question I, is I, why wouldn't they spray in the wetland too? Because there's chemicals that are available to do that. But that's another peel of the onion. Sorry. Yeah, what, is, what is a spray for? Vegetation control. control. Okay. I, I, I assume that was the case, but that's that that still is open in terms of, you know, vegetation control. What does it mean in terms of controlling vegetation in that case? I mean, they could kill everything they wanted to in that case. I mean, I, mean, I, I do think that a, a, in large part, this is based on a, um, a desktop review, potentially, because you have um, water supply zones and things included in here, which you can't delineate based on just riding on the tracks. Um, I think that they must utilize GIS on some level to distinguish and particularly like natural heritage endangered species areas and things like that um, to differentiate those areas so that they can exclude them from the spray zones. Um, so, I just am wondering how up to date this is and if it's, you know, how accurate it is and stuff like that, that it might be good to take a second look at it. In the interest of moving us forward, I think that we're a little bit off topic at this point. Um, where I think that the question in front of us is whether or not we need to notify a butters. Mm -hmm. These other issues are going to come in front of us later on. I mean, so it's important discussion, but I think it's a little premature at this point. Um, so with the question of a butters, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm okay with them being notified, but I don't find it necessary for me particularly. I agree because they're not even in their, our jurisdiction. Yeah, I agree with that too. So do I. So. I mean, if they're sorry, I'm sorry if I'm taking us off track again. I just I'm trying to make sure I understand. If they're not in our jurisdiction, are, aren't we just talking about the abutters that are with it? Then why are they asking for a waiver if they're not within our jurisdiction? No, this would be for notice of abutters within our jurisdiction. Within a jurisdiction, right? Yes. So for the wetlands that are along this path, don't quite know how that was. Delineated, I agree. Which is a different issue. It, yeah. it would be for the entire right of way. They would have to notify a butters within 300 feet of the entire right of way okay. for it. And so I think the idea being they're notifying a lot of people that aren't near wetlands or aren't, you know, in jurisdictional areas and potentially getting a lot of people stirred up um, when they're in potentially no spray zones and have no impact whatsoever on them. And there's no way to, to delineate that out. And just notify abutters of that are in spray zones or within wetland areas. Because I mean, I see Fletcher's point. Would be everyone. What, Jen? So our so our constituency here would be the people who 
are abutting wetlands or in wetlands, right? right? right. And they wouldn't be sprayed. Right. 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 So our constituency here would receive notification that they will spray, but not in their areas. So that's what, I guess that's kind of my question is like, then why is this being brought forward in the first place if they're not spraying in our area? If that well, makes no, sense. They, in our constituency's area. Because, yeah, they, because think they, they have to verify all. what those spray zones are and are not. So that's right. for, for so it's a delineation their. question, which is why it's an RDA. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So it sounds like we can take on the delineation with the RDA, Anna. It's just that by that yeah. point, that constituency will not have been notified. That's the yep. Thank you. Decision point. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so I heard at least a few people who said that they are fine with no butter a butter notification. Is there anybody on the opposite side who'd like to speak up? I'm still landing on when in doubt notify. I, I mean, I, I just am always going to say the more we can engage people in the process, even if it does rile them up, even if it's a pain, sorry, I'm still landing on that side. Okay. So and I, I, and I think I'm with, I'm somewhere in between here, Brett, because so get with the RDA, if we get to a point where we're trying to figure out, out what this delineation is based on and it, you know, we end up digging that up, should mm -hmm. those abutters and that constituency be involved in that conversation or aware that that conversation is happening. Right. So, um, <laughs> so that might be why we have in our bylaw that we notify for, for RDAs. Um, so that would be my only hang up. Okay. So anybody else? Okay, so um, we're definitely, I'm hearing a split decision here. Um, and so, but what I'm hearing is a plurality voting for no butter notification. Uh, do we need a vote on this, Aaron, or just a? I would, I would just for, just to, so we have a record of it, I think it's a good idea. Okay, in which case we need a motion or something along those lines as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, I um, move to waive a butter notification under the bylaw. For oh, you're muted, Laura. Okay. Oh, okay. You're muted halfway through. Okay, um, so I waive. Um, I move to waive the abutter notification under by bylaw for the railway for RDA application. Seconded. Okay, so we're gonna do a voice vote. And just to be clear, um, so if you are voting aye, that means that you are in favor of the waiver. If you are voting nay, then you are opposed to it, meaning that you want a butter notification and then you can obviously abstain as well. So Laura, I wanna make sure aye. you- Aye, please. Are you yawning? Leroy? Aye. Anna? Nay. Jen? Nay. Larry? Aye. Fletcher? Aye. And I as well. Okay. So uh, split decision on that one, but it does pass. So thank you, everyone. How exciting. We always normally agree on everything. It's good to have I a know. <laughs> I know. I like it. <laughs> uh, just like the Supreme Court. Okay, um, so why don't we keep moving on? So Aaron, is it okay if we go to our 715 at this point? Absolutely. Oh, and you're already there. Okay, excellent. So I don't have any host control. So can you bring in the panelists? So Beth in particular? Absolutely. And I'm gonna make you a co-host as well, Brett, so you can run the show as well. And if anybody else um, wants to speak, I'm not sure who the other presenters are, but if anybody else wants to speak um, for the first hearing for the Faring Brook restoration, raise your hand and we'll promote you to panelist. Okay, and so we have talked about this before, but am I correct in thinking that we have not officially opened it? We have not officially opened it. Okay, therefore I shall officially open it. <clears throat> This public hearing is now called to order. This hearing is being held as required by the provisions of chapter 131, section 40 of the general laws of the Commonwealth. 
an act relative to the protection of wetlands as most recently amended in Article 13, in Article 3.31, wetlands protection under the Town of Amherst general bylaws. This is for Town of Amherst for riverbank restoration and floodplain creation along the Faring Brook located off Belchertown Road, map 15C, parcels 22 and 23, map 15A, parcel 47. Welcome, Beth. And so, Beth, if you would please introduce yourself and give us an overview of the project. Sure. Um, I'm Beth Wilson. I'm the environmental scientist with uh, the Amherst Department of Public Works. And yeah, I did an informal discussion with you guys already with this project, and I know you have a really full agenda tonight. So um, what I was hoping to do is give a general overview again of the project and then talk about some of the um, updates to the NOI since the informal discussion, um, if that works out for everybody. And just one comment about that railroad stuff. I do remember riding on the railroad to confirm the wetlands. I mean, that was the way we did it. We didn't, you know, hire a third party or anything. And I think I only did that once. So that would have been five years ago. Stephanie would have done it before that. And most likely in terms of the abutters, I followed what she had done. The only thing that does come to mind is I know MassDOT has always been able to get out of a butter notification uh, legally. They would send us a document that said that as a, a state uh, utility or a state um, office, they were able to get out of that. And I, I, if Aaron, I would just suggest going and looking at the file from the, the previous uh, time that they came before us five years ago and just see if that's part of it too, because I don't, I can't remember the abutter part, but I did ride on the train. It was great. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. I can know. All right, so um, this is the Fairingbrook floodplain creation uh, project. Um, and this is the site location. Uh, this area is the about 18,000 square foot floodplain area that um, that's, it's gonna be created in this, in this hatched area um, on the Southern bank of the Fairingbrook all the way up to its confluence with the Fort River. Um, and then the project also includes stormwater drainage improvements on the north side, on the north side of the brook. Um, and then to give a general overview of sort of the construction sequence for the project, this whole, this is the floodplain area. It's gonna get, first thing that'll happen is that area will get cleared. Um, then the access roads will be hardened along with um, a construction entrance pad and a soil uh, stockpiling and project staging area here. So that'll all get hardened. Um, and then the erosion control will be installed. They're using, uh, proposing to use a compost filter tube all along the bank of the brook. Um, and then I'm, I'm assuming Aaron and I talked a little bit about this, that we're gonna be using a turbidity curtain downstream of the limit of work within the Fort River itself. So here or so, and then I, I'm picturing maybe two turbidity curtains, one there and then one um, in the Fairing Brook right before its confluence with the Fort River. Um, and then the next uh, stage of the project would be uh, once the clearing's done and all the erosion control is in, we would do the, um, the in-stream work, which is uh, boulder clusters that are going to be installed in the stream. And um, we put in the NO, NOI three to five of those. There's only three shown on the plans, but we might increase that. Um, the purpose of the boulder clusters is to improve um, bed diversity and in-stream habitat. Each cluster consists of six boulders. Um, I think two to three of them are sort of buried and are and to stabilize the other boulders on top. They're, they're pointed in a direction to, to um, move the flow of the stream, create some pools and riffles. 
Uh, so those would go in and at the same time, um, we're we're hoping to use some of the wood that's cleared from the site um, in the stream also. So to pull it, to place some large woody debris in the stream to also just improve stream habitat. Um, there's also going to be these four areas where core logs are going to be placed with um, cobble toes, and those are just to stabilize the bank in those four locations. Um, once that work is complete, the excavation of the soil and the grading of the soil will happen. These are the new grading lines on this sheet right here. Um, it'll be graded sloping to the south, so it will slope up this in this direction um, and all that soil will be removed from the site. Once the excavation is done, uh, we'll be building two of these large woody habitat structures um, within the floodplain itself and those are going to consist of uh, I think it was up to 10 actual boulders and large tree limbs again we'll be reusing the lumber that's cleared from the site to construct those habitat features. And then the site will be uh, planted, replanted with all native species. Um, this is our planting plan on this sheet. And you know the, the overall goal of the project is to lower the banks um, to a point where the water can can flow over the banks um, much more frequently, can um, spread out to, to slow the flows and allow sediment deposition and treatment of the water by the vegetation. You know, the water that ends up actually getting back, getting into the Fort River will, will, get, will get treated in this area, but the whole area is also really an area where water can infiltrate. Um, and again, this will draw water from the channel, which will slow flows and slow erosion happening in the channel. Um, and uh, on top of that, the, this project is getting rid of a whole lot of invasives. So it's, it's really improving um, habitat in, in this, this large 18,000 square foot area. Um, right now, you know, in the report, I documented the invasive species that are in there. There's photos, there's there's every kind of invasive. There's bittersweet that's that's taking down uh, the few mature trees that are there. Um, this whole area here is all Japanese knotweed. There there isn't any um, mature trees or anything in this area. It's just knotweed. So this project will that'll be a, a it's a goal and it's a great benefit is that um, it'll get replanted with native species. Um, and then I wanted to show you some of the changes since the informal discussion. The biggest change is that this um, the soil stockpiling area is is going to be turned into a, a permanent parking area for the community gardens. Um, so it's about it's about 40 by 100. It'll get hardened just to be used for the for the project as a stockpiling area for soil and staging. But when the project's over, we're going to uh, excavate down about a foot, backfill it with gravel, um, hard pack, and then stone dust to create a nice parking area for the community gardens. Um, I worked with the engineers just talking a bit about stormwater in terms of it, and we're, we're going to slope it in the southeasterly direction and put in a, a grass swale along the east and south southeast corner and it'll it'll drain out over here the community gardens are here so the water hopefully will it won't be going uh we'll try and keep that area dry for people to walk from the parking area to the community gardens um and that was i i thought i only had five minutes tonight is what aaron told me so but if if people want to hear more details i you know, we, we've talked about it at the informal discussion. I'm happy to answer questions and provide provide more information. So Aaron, do you have any comments you have before we get, before we open it up? Um, I sent Beth a list of um, my questions and recommended conditions. Beth, do you want to go over those or do you want me to go over them? Because you have um, the answers to the questions, so I don't know if you 
Um, yeah, I don't have it in front of me, um, okay. but I, I remember one was the turbidity curtain question, and we and we are going to have turbidity curtains in there as part of our erosion control. Um, and I think I, I can remember some, I know you were asking about um, oversight of the project and there's money in the grant to, to hire um, an engineer to oversight. And the way this is looking is we're gonna probably contract with some, with an environmental consultant to, to oversee the, the contractor and they may subcontract to the actual contractor themselves. So either way we do it, um, there will be an environmental consultant on site for the project and they can be the environmental monitor and provide um, the reports to the Conservation Commission. Okay, great. And um, just to run through my other questions, um, which, and I can just jump on Beth's answers because I have them right in front of me. Um, I was asking about at what point um, erosion controls would be installed, but I think Beth covered that pretty well in her presentation that it would be prior to the um, excavation and grading. And that was really my biggest concern was to make sure that they were installed prior to that. Um, and then she covered the issue about the um, turbidity curtain being installed. And then again, um, environmental monitor and there's funds in the budget. And I think that we should have it be a condition that the monitor be out there and provide us reports on a regular basis. And then my other question was how the site will be buttoned up at the close of business day and also on weekends. Um, and Beth's, Beth indicated that um, the equipment would be moved out of the floodplain and um, up on top of the hill. So it was out of the work area on a nightly basis and that erosion controls would be checked um, and in place in the evening and that stockpiles would be covered and then um, my recommended conditions again were um, in the in the application there was a note that the, the contractor that selected to do the work would have to provide um, a work plan. And so um, I just requested as part of the conditions that the Conservation Commission be provided that work plan um, for review and also um, the contact information for the responsible party for monitoring and then whatever you guys think is a good monitoring schedule if it's after a rainstorm if it's monthly um, weekly whatever you guys think and then um, state and local our state and local boilerplate conditions should also be included okay thank you Erin okay so comments from the commission I have a few, I have a few questions did somebody else start? Am I interrupting? Go ahead, Jen. Um, thanks. So when are, when is this going to happen and how long will it take, Beth? I'm sorry, I'm sure you said this, but I just, as a reminder. Um, we're shooting for August of this year. So August okay. to, you know, the end of September, probably. Okay. So low, That's low, cool. low flow. Yep. Is that, okay. Low flow. And mm -hmm. if we happen to have a very wet summer, <laughs> uh, what will happen? <laughs> <laughs> um yeah so this this whole site is in flood zone really um so if we have a really wet summer the contractor i mean we're going to still go forward with it i'm assuming um the the contractor would really need to be paying attention to when storms are coming and when when they're when they're not in terms of getting his equipment out of there and buttoning everything up yeah um, you know so yeah, because by the when once this gets excavated and replanted, um, you know, there's going to be a time there where where soil is going to be easily moved if something major happens. So, um, yeah, and well, and and the the plan does call for some um, matting too. You know, there's matting that they can use uh, depending on really how close the plants are. I suppose they can spread as much of that as they need, or when they're in, if they have to leave the site because rain is coming and they haven't gotten to planting certain areas, you know, um, matting can be used and they just have to be prepared to saw like all contractors to come up with ideas on how to control erosion on the site, you know, but. Um, right, yeah, and that's where I was kind of going and Aaron, I'm sure this is what you had in mind when you were asking about kind of who the consultant is and who's providing monitoring reports, but 
inevitably there'll be a one to two inch rain event when this is at its most fragile point in construction. So we just, I just want to make sure that we have controls in place to put in extra erosion controls and like really button up the site. Um, Cause they're, you, you know, by default, by definition, the project is like working with lots of sediment in the most fragile part of the creek, I guess. Um, so Erin, I'm sure that's what you had in mind, but if we need to add stronger language to the conditions, um, I can help with that and brainstorm what that verbiage might be. Yeah, um, I, I just lost my Wi-Fi for about three minutes while you were talking oh. there, Jen. So um, I'm sorry, and I don't want you to have to reiterate everything you just said, but yeah, that would be great if we could incorporate what you just suggested into the condition. Yeah, just stronger language about making sure we have control, like the levers we need so that when the site is at its most vulnerable from an erosion control standpoint, we can make sure that all measures are taken to protect water quality should there be a big storm or flood event, storm and flood event. Um, and then my next question, Beth, so I, I'm still getting my head around the fact that this is happening in the wet. Um, I expected some sort of diversion channel for Fearing Brook um, during the install of the boulder clusters um, and the like near stream quiet, like core mat and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, it's gonna be hard to do because <laughs> what will happen is they'll like start digging up the channel, turbidity will skyrocket. It'll be really hard to see what's happening. And then you'll have to like kind of install these these boulder clusters like with an excavator arm where you can't really see them. So I guess I don't know if I have a good solution, but I'm like worried that there's going to be a lot of machinery necessary to do this and it's going to be difficult for them to see what's going on. Um, that's just from it's literally having been an engineer on site at these projects. Like even when we weren't required by regulations to divert, we often did um, because of that reason. So I don't know if we need like some sort of estimate of like flow levels that are okay for the in-stream work. Um, like if flow levels are, I don't, I, I don't, I don't want to throw numbers out there, but like if we have like a full wetted width of the creek, you know, and that might not be the best time to go in and do the in-stream work, like maybe at lower flows. Mm -hmm. So like they could technically do the grading on the floodplain and then go in and do the in-stream work, you know, like, so there mm -hmm. should be some sensitivity to the timing of the in-stream work to the flow levels in the creek. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And that you could definitely write a condition that says that, you know, that, that, um, that like it, that there has to be sensitivity to it. And then you could even come up with some kind of a, of a flow measurement, like you were saying, um, the width of the stream, you know, like I was just out there today and with the flows there right now, because it's been so dry, I don't think if an excavator came down and was able to stay on the bank and was able to, you know, plop these boulders, which the boulders are uh, supposed to be 12 to 24 inches. So they're not gigantic. They're sort of, they're good sized boulders, but not excavators can carry much bigger than that. But I can see an excavator coming in and being able to dig and plop those in without, um, you know, causing too much disturbance to the stream with the flow there is today. But yeah. certainly you wouldn't want to be doing it after a storm, even, you know, within, 24 hours, 48 hours after a big storm event, probably. Um, so what you're suggesting, sort of a width of, of the um, sort of submerged channel might be a good measurement. Yep. Um, and chances are the contractor isn't going to want to do it <laughs> in like the super wet. So we're both protecting right. ourselves and it's to everyone's best interest, but that might be worth conditioning. Um, yeah, I have to think about like what the technical terminology would be for that. You know, it's like really it's low flow conditions, but how do right. we like, how do we uh, make that? You, 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 you could do something with 
something you could do, like you had said, the sort of the width of the submerged channel, but also you could do uh, no previous rain events in 48 to even more, 72 hours, something like that, so that they really end up having to pick what, what days to do it based on um, recent storm events. Yeah. Or you just say, you know, make sure that the contractor can see what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> There's that. Yeah, I mean, I just, you just never know, you know? Oh, totally. You have to make it very clear. Yeah. yeah, and that's the worst thing when you, like, when the con there aren't tight controls and then you can't control when machinery is in the creek because that's, like, the most sensitive time, right? Um, now, Beth, is that something that we could um, work out in the the um, the work plan that the contractor is submitting to review that and set those parameters at that time. I'm just wondering if if we need to include that level of specificity in the order of conditions, or if we could say hmm. we reserve the right to um, to modify the work plan in compliance with the order of conditions to protect the resource areas or something like that. Yeah, I think, yeah, you could. Yeah, and you could even, when you're saying a work plan is required, say uh, specifying construction sequence, including when in-stream work is gonna be done, um, specifically having to do with low flow or something like that, so that they know that that, that has to go into the work plan a more detailed description of, of that sort of decision process about when to do the, um, the boulder clusters. Now, Jen, do you think that a condition like that would be adequate to, for all your comments? Cause I missed some of them. And I want to make yeah, sure. no, I think that's good, Erin. And I think that it's actually probably the best solution because the work plan will happen closer to when they're trying to do the work. And then we'll know what kind of summer in season we're having, you know, if we're setting up for a low flow, a true low flow season or not, um, it's less and less predictable, I feel like lately. Um, yeah, so I think that's great. Thank you, good idea. I have one more question. Uh, and just one quick comment. So I noticed that there's one person from the public who has their hand up and just let them know that once we're through with all of the comments from the commissioners, uh, I will go to the general public. So sorry, Jen. No, this is my, I'm, well, I might think of more comments, but I think this is the last one I know of right now. Um, I'm sure that this is in the notes on one of the plan sheets, on the planting plan sheet. I just can't zoom in enough to read. Is there a survivorship, like, protection for the planting plan? Like, what is the plan for, like, what percentage of the natives that go in that have to stay alive? Is there any maintenance? Are we going back in and pulling out the knotweed next spring? Like, how are we going to make sure that we give this a fighting chance? Mm -hmm. um, it's in the, so in the NOI itself, it, it has a um, little discussion about O&M, which is uh, at least two years of monitoring to make sure the vegetation, which I think is sort of a standard for replication areas under the Wetlands Protection Act, but two years of um, monitoring the vegetation and removing any invasives that do reemerge that's what was in there. Fletcher, what do you think of that? Yeah, it's gonna, it's a really dicey spot already. Um, but they're going to excavate to get a lot of that out, but you're going to get stuff coming downstream. So two years, I, it would be nice to, you know, I don't know if we can do more or if we can, you know, get like a volunteer group or something to monitor it or something. It, it's going to come back. Mm -hmm. So the question is, how aggressive do you want to keep it at bay? Um, yeah, I know that doesn't really help, but I really do appreciate, Jen, what you're saying is about at least the, the survivorship of what is planted. Um, that happens all the time. They plant stuff and it just dies. They're, usually what happens is people overplant for that purpose, but to make sure that there's a certain percentage of survivorship, I think, is key to get, at least get those roots in there and, and establish themselves. Yeah, and not Fletcher, get taken over by knotweed. Yeah, and right. Fletcher, to your point, there's lots of invasives right across the stream and on yeah. both ends of the extent of work. So 
Oh yeah, coming back. totally. So that they're going to be there, but the question is, I, I like, I appreciate the idea of um, making sure whatever is planted, there's a certain percentage of survivorship. Because at least if they can get there and establish themselves, they're going to do what you just said, what you explained, Beth, in terms of the the, um, the benefits to the stream. So at least that will be there. Um, but you, you got to stay on top of it, and you know, we we that's the problem when we permit these things all the time, like. You know, we're like, oh, they're gonna like, they're like, yeah, we're gonna take care of the invasives, but yeah, they walk away after two years. Well, don't forget well, this is Amherst Town Lane. So no, I know that's why that's <laughs> so that's why I, actually so I was that's what I was getting that's why this is there's actually potential to make be this to be successful. And I was gonna ask like, are you putting up signage and stuff to show? Nobody reads signs, but it'd be really cool to show signage. So like, I'm sure that, because it's a big grant, Beth. That and there's a community yeah. gardens there. So because there's something to kind of get it all in there. Oh yeah, no. There's a there's a kiosk that we got through uh, through this grant, but then there's other signage for Fort River Farm. I know that some exists already, but I think probably Dave has plans of other um, signage. So there'll be plenty of information about this project um, out there, and um, just in terms of monitoring, since it is the conservation area, you know, this project has got so much funding based on the grant, but then future monitoring, you know, it is our conservation area, uh, which I, and Dave would know more and Aaron maybe down the road, we're really hoping there's people out there using the community gardens and um, and and so there'll be staff going out there every now and then. And, and you know, Brad eventually will be trying to keep the invasives out of here and hopefully going after some of more of the invasives that are down, down the road, you know, there's a, the walking path comes along here and it's gonna keep, it goes this way along the Fort River. And if you follow that path down here, there's more knotweed, you know, it's, it's all there. And that's really maintenance of the conservation area that we need to keep up with. Yeah, and Beth mentioned a good point when we we're out in the field. So the property across the street is school grounds. So town school. And so the potential for that to be a educational project with the school uh, obviously, Fort River School um, would be very interesting and cool. Right, or like you know, I, I don't know. You know, if you sign up to be a community gardener, you you do a weed pulling day once a year or something. I don't, you know, I don't know. You got to do something. It and would be have... a shame to see this go back to not weed, which we, it's going to try to do. We have um, mm -hmm. um, mitigation funds from EverSource as well, from a for a good chunk of. Fun. So like something like this, I think would be a great application for a long term, but I, hmm. I just want to make sure that we're not getting hung up on these details because we have 12 hearings tonight. Um, just to remind everyone. Right. Can I just mute. a couple of quick comments? I know you guys got to, um, so I think this has been a great conversation. Yes, we need to, uh, this might be like a stronghold. We need to really, um, I agree with you, Fletcher. I agree with you, Jen. We, you know, this might be our you know, this is where we draw the line here and then we try to aggressively keep both invasives out of this area and then move up, up the fearing and down the fort. So it's idealistic, I know, but um, maybe we, we kind of try to stand our ground here and, and, and make a stand. So I think that's great. Um, Beth, I'm just kind of reminding you that, and me, more importantly me, that we need to, um, we need to talk more to the schools, right? And we need to yep. talk with um, the abutter um, uh, to the west. Um, so we'll we'll get that done. Um, and then um, this is probably a very minor point, but Beth, you mentioned earlier the soils the soils leaving this site. And I have I don't want to get into this now. I don't want to get into the weeds or the seeds or the rhizomes, but like this is exactly how knot weeds spreads, right? You you dig it out. And we move it to another site and it's somebody else's problem. So maybe we give that some thought. I don't mm -hmm. know what that is, but I don't want to take the time tonight. And then lastly, Beth, I don't know, and, and I could be just not remembering this, but um, Kestrel does own a CR over this property. Um, and I don't recall having a lot of conversations with them about the project, but I think we probably should brief them about the project um sooner than later so i'll put that on my list and maybe okay. we can zoom with you and aaron and myself 
just to talk them through this? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I have a vague recollection of, of Stephanie talking to them or at some point talking to them about it, but it's been a long time. I think we've talked to their past land specialist, Paul Gag Gagnon, I believe was how you pronounce his name. Oh, um, so he's gone, huh? He's gone now. And um, lastly, I just love how Jen, how you call it a creek. I love, I love that it's a creek. <laughs> so, um, I, I've got, I I've got a, stream. I've got, I have a background ignorance question. I assume that that water comes from the area below, south of College Street and west of Southeast Street in the area that Amherst College is. How does it get there? How does it get to the sanctuary in Amherst College? No, no. How does it, well, how does it get from Amherst College to there? It goes under Southeast Street. So there is that's what my part of my question. So there is a there is a channel or there's a conduit that carries under Southeast Street over there behind and below the uh, the uh, uh, the yep. bank the bank. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it goes under the Florence Savings Bank building and then. Other pipes join it. Um, it's what actually ends up coming out into the Fearing Brook is sort of a combination of tributaries right there at that intersection, um, and then it, and then the Fearing Brook, the outfall is right behind where Michael's Billiards used to be. Yeah, that's yeah, where but, all yeah. those. Yeah, I, I can see that part because I'm looking at the town map and so forth. But I would just I was. My, it was my ignorance. I'm stupid about where that came from. And I, you know, all of a sudden here's Fearing Brook and I know it's over there, but it, it's like some other places in town which, which we can talk about up toward Triangle Street where water disappears and comes up someplace else. Or Fearing Avenue or Fearing yeah. Street, you know, there's- you know. Fortunately, that's on our agenda tonight, isn't it? Eventually. Tam, Tam Brook. Yeah, eventually yeah, we'll, we'll get that. Yeah, right. I think that that exact reason that you just articulated, Larry, the fact that this, that, you know, Fearing Brook is underground under the East Amherst Center, like intersection, is exactly why this project is so cool, though, because what happens is sediment is probably just shunted through that's, that, that's, that that's underground right. system. And then, you know, this is the perfect situation to like allow sediment to settle out here and be a functional kind of textbook floodplain where you have you know, accretion of fine sediments. So Beth, like, you know, I hope you, my, all my questions are icing on the cake and I think it's a really exciting project. I think that's, that's the, that's why I brought it up is because it really yeah. goes back to what's, what's, what's feeding all that. Yeah. So Beth, I have yeah. two questions related to the work going on here, both related to endangered species. And so you have a couple out here. And so when we were in the field, you mentioned what's happening with the mussels. Um, so there's at least potential habitat for endangered mussels here. There's also turtles right. and when we're in the field. We didn't mention turtles. So can you just comment real quickly about what the plans are to deal with both of those? Um, yeah. So natural heritage, um, reviewed this and in both cases, they want, um, well, for the turtles, they want a turtle protection plan, um, put together and, and I'm pretty sure they were requiring, a uh, environmental consultant turtle specialist to put the plan together. Um, so we'll have that done prior to the project. Typically that means sweeping for turtles and possibly putting up some barriers for the turtles, which often can be instead of, um, instead of the compost, the, the filter tubes, it may actually be silt fence, but we'll, you know, we'll work with somebody on that. And the mussels is the same thing that we need a muscle specialist who's going to right before uh, con construction starts, they sweep the area where the um, boulder clusters are gonna go. And I think the farthest east boulder cluster may be the only one that's actually in the mapped natural heritage area. These other boulder clusters are outside of it, um, but that area needs to be sweeped for mussels and then the mussels will be get relocated by the biologist. Okay, thank you, Beth. And then maybe I missed it when you were presenting earlier, but I just want to make sure that the commission realizes that there's also a piece of this project that is on the north bank of this that goes into uh, Fort River School. And that's going to create some additional work that's happening here. Yes. Yeah, I didn't, I, I know I had talked to you guys about that at the informal and I, I didn't know how much time I had tonight <laughs> to talk about all of those things. 
Okay. And then Beth, you said that you are waiting for a letter from DEP. Has that arrived yet? Uh, yeah, Aaron. Uh, yep, Aaron forwarded it to me today, and surprisingly, they had no comments, hmm. which is okay. which is wonderful. Which is wonderful. <laughs> so we have a DEP number, and uh, Mark had no comments. Um, that is surprising. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, any other comments from commissioners on this? Okay, so I'm going to open it up to the general public now. So somebody had their hand up before, but it's down now. So if you want to re-raise your hand or if there's somebody else wants to raise their hand and we can allow you to speak. Okay. So Cindy, I hit the magic button. So you should be able to speak now. Oh, good. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yep. Hello? Yes, oh, we can hear you. Um, my name is Cindy Del Pepper. I'm with the uh, Cindy Del Papper with the Division of Ecological Restoration, and I am the project manager for this, uh, for DER, for this project. We are partnering with this um, town on the Abbey Brook, um, Fearing Brook Restoration, wrong urban river. Um, and uh, I just wanted to speak about the boulder clusters. Um, they take literally minutes to put in. Um, um, if you have a contractor who knows what they're doing, which hopefully we will get. And um, the bed material at this section of Fearing Brook is almost 60% gravel and the rest is sand. So there shouldn't be too much turbidity. Um, the turbidity is coming from upstream and from the bank material. So um, I, I agree that they shouldn't be doing it um, in anything but the lowest flows they can manage, but it should go very quickly. It's not a day, days long um, undertaking. And the other excavation is all going to be above mean high water. So provided we don't have a tropical storm or a hurricane come through, um, mostly it will be in the dry, we hope. Excellent, thank you, Cindy. Okay. Uh, any other comments or questions? So it doesn't sound like we're waiting on anything else. So I think if at this point, um, Beth, if you could unshare your screen and then Aaron, you have a motion that is ready for this? Um, and then there's an additional. I actually don't have a motion prepared for this one, um, but So the, the DEP number is 089684. Um, and I have the conditions listed um, here under conditions. The only other condition that um, we, I sort of like a, a catch all condition um, besides, of course, the state and local um, boilerplates would be that the a condition stating that the commission reserves the right to modify contractor work plan construction sequencing specifically based on stream conditions. Range. Hey guys, am I the only one having a hard time hearing Erin? No, she's cutting in and out. I was going to let her okay. know when she was right. done. Sorry. I'm going to stop my video. Hopefully that'll help. Um, uh, so in addition to the, the conditions that are listed, um, here on the screen, I would, there was one other condition, which is a catch-all um, that the commission reserves the right to modify the contractor work plan, construction, sequ construction sequencing specifically based on stream conditions, rain events um, for in, and stream, um, and rain events for in-stream work. Okay, thank you, Aaron. So Jen, would you like to make a motion? Uh, Yes. So when would or so, okay. So I move that we um, approve approve the NOI, Aaron. Yes. Yep. Approve the NOI for um shoot, I'm just getting the DEP number up. Hold on. For um DEP project number 089-0684. 
Um, and this is the Fearing Brook Floodplain Restoration Project in Amherst, Massachusetts, with the conditions um, that a contractor work plan must be provided to the Co um, Conservation Commission for review prior to the start of work. Um, a monitoring party or person um, responsible must be identified with the contact with contact information for construction supervision and planning on the site. Um, all state and local boilerplate um, conditions should be included. And then um, that the Conservation Commission reserves the right to um, change the order of operations on the site um, in order to protect water quality um, in the event of a major you know, storm um, so that we can uh, avoid work in the wet when necessary, when possible. <clears throat> Second. Okay, thank you. So voice vote, um, let's see, Larry. Aye. Laura? Aye. Uh, Jen? Aye. Anna? Aye. Fletcher? Aye. Leroy? Aye. And aye for me as well. So we are good on this one. So thank you very much, Beth. We look forward to yeah, seeing the great work that happens here. This is cool. Long thank time. Thank you. Coming. Thank you. Have a good long meeting. <laughs> Thanks, you can stay if you want, Beth. I am at my office. I need to go home now. Bye. <laughs> Okay, so uh, we're gonna move on to our next item. Um, and so Ward, if you are here, and so if, um, Aaron, if you can get, let Ward in, I'm, I'll officially open the meeting. This public hearing is now called to order. This hearing is being held as required by the provisions of chapter 131, section 40 of the general laws of the Commonwealth and act relative to the protection of wetlands as most recently amended in article 3.31 wetlands protection under the town of Amherst general bylaws. This is Ward Smith for Gordon Paley for construction of single home, uh, of a single home, single family home in a buffer zone of bordering vegetated wetlands located at 24 Paley Village Road, map 21B, parcel 87. So welcome Ward and if I... you introduce yourself and give a brief background on the on the project, please. Yep, I'm uh, Ward Smith, professional wetland scientist. Um, this is lot five, Pally Village Road. This was a subdivision that was previously approved by the Conservation Commission, but the order of conditions has expired. This is the last lot in the subdivision that was never developed. It was cleared and the lot is still cleared, um, but the, the the property was never developed for a single family house. I redelineated the wetlands. The wetlands were originally delineated by Chuck Douchey. Um, I redelineated the wetlands in the fall. Um, the, essentially what Chuck delineated, I think my flags were a little bit higher, which is usually what happens when I redelineate no line. Um, the, it, it's a 2,200 square foot, two story house. Uh, the lot is not, doesn't have a ton of space, but there's enough space to maintain a 35 foot setback from the wetland line. Uh, this, the, the work limit is proposed to be silt fence on the plan. I would expect the Conservation Commission to require a double erosion control line given the slopes there. It, it's, it's, it's fairly steep, not super steep, but it's fairly steep. So there's going to be a walkout basement in the back and the front of the area will be lawn with a paved driveway. That's basically a synopsis of the project. Great, thank you, Ward. Erin? Yes, so I'll just show photos for anybody who didn't make it out there. Um, this is standing down at the toe of the slope, um, looking west. Well, Erin, and your voice is cutting in and out again. I, I think it's a Wi-Fi issue. I'm gonna just do my best. I turn my video off. Um, this is looking directly at the wetland. This is looking um, north. Um, this is the lot standing at the road facing down. And then this is from the road looking east as well. 
Um, I don't really have any major concerns about this. This work was already approved as part of the subdivision um, plan, but um, I do agree with Ward that we should have staked straw bales as well as a toad in filter fabric silt fence um, as a requirement for work. I also think that this, the erosion control barrier is gonna have to be monitored by someone and we should have a contact name and phone number for whomever that is so that we know who is responsible for that monitoring. Um, we should definitely have an erosion control inspection at the start of work um, and stabilization measures at the completion of work as well as an inspection by me once everything is stabilized before erosion controls are um, removed. And then boiler plate and state conditions are also recommended. Okay, thank you, Erin. Okay, so uh, I'll open up for the commission. And so one question I had for you, Ward, is there anything in the plan for permanent demarcation of the wetland boundary? The there is not. If you would like to require that, that would be fine. And what would you like to see as permanent demarcation? Uh, boulders are our preferred mode of demarcation. For the 30, for the 35 foot setback? Okay, yep. That's what I would say. But. Yep, I have no problem with that. Okay. Um, and then I also noticed that there, so you basically try to keep all of the house out of the 50. It creeps in a little bit. Um, that's probably from the re-demarcation, but yes. it looks like it's mostly out of there. Um, and is there something in there about how the lawn, particularly, you know, on that back part is going to be treated or more specifically not treated? So no chemicals and that sort of. Again, you can, you can put that in as a condition. It's hard to enforce, but you know yeah I, I, yep yeah we is. have that as a boilerplate um condition for state and local that um yeah. with specific requirements for um herbicides and pesticides cool and fertilizers i think the most most of their lawn is going to be in the front i don't know that the backyard is going to have and i think especially if you're requiring the boulders which makes sense that's going to keep it's going to limit their use of the backyard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's kind of shady in that back anyways. So a little wet, obviously. How about other commissioners? Any sort of comments or thoughts on this one? Seems pretty straightforward. The other houses are already fully built, fully occupied. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Okay, um, so any comments or questions from the general public, you can use the Zoom feature of raise your hand. Okay, not hearing any, looking for a motion. Um, I move to uh, accept the, uh, the NOI for 24 Pally Village Road but we're just going to make sure we're going to have the double erosion control with the stake bales and the towed in filter fabric. We'll have the um, boulders to delineate the 35 foot um, um, wetland boundary. And let me just read that right off there, Aaron. Is that what you want? Sure. I mean, it's, you're doing great. Erosion control. Um, you have to let us, please let us know before, um, after installation is in, before the start of work. Let us know who's going to be responsible for the uh, monitoring and make sure the site's going to be stabilized and we'll be inspecting it when, when everything's in place. And then you'll see the rest of our boilerplate uh, state and local conditions. If you have any other questions. Thank you. Looking for a second. Second. Excellent. So voice vote, Anna. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Leroy. Aye. Jen. Hi. Larry. Hi. Laura. Hi. Uh, the people jumped around on me. So did I lose anyone? We're good. Okay. And I for myself as well. So thank you very much, Ward. We thank are good. And you'll be you. getting paperwork from Aaron. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Okay. So we are moving on to a uh, continuation. And so uh, this is from Haynes Hydrogeologic Consulting for Amherst Poor Farm. And so if the applicants are here for this, 
Uh, I will make you a panelist. Okay, so where do you go? Should be over here. Okay, well, I see Meredith is in and I thought Dave was here too. Uh, and then Alan Weiss is here for this. Dave is somewhere out there. Yeah, I, yeah. Dave, if you can raise your hand again. Oh, there you are. Wait, wait, don't raise it. I can see you. Oh, man, you moved too quick. <laughs> okay, there we go. There he is. And is that right that Alan Weiss is a part of this as well? No, no that was an error, I think, in the... Okay, so we can just put Alan back into the general pool. So, hello, Alan, and uh, you'll, you'll still be here. So, welcome, though. Night, Alan. Uh, Dave, David Haynes for the applicant. Are you, or do you have to make an announcement? Nope. Uh, my only announcement was please introduce yourself and um, just update us on where we are at. Yes, uh, David Haynes for Haynes Hydrogeologic Consulting representing the applicants on this. Uh, we would like to request a continuance to your next meeting on April uh, 28th for the purpose of revising the notice of intent for the exclusion of the enforcement issue and or for the restoration issue and also to fine tune all of the agricultural uses that we want to do on the property give you a more complete plan. So we would like to have a continuous until the 28th, if you would, at 730, please. Okay. Looking for a motion to continue. I move we continue this to April 27th at 730. April 28th. 28th, sorry. The 730 threw me off. Move to continue this to April 28th at 730. Second. Thank you. So voice vote. Fletcher. Aye. Anna. Aye. Jen. Aye. Larry stepped away. Leroy. Oh, I'm, here. I'm here. I. And Laura. Laura. Aye. Good. Yeah. Good. Um, and then I from um, from me as well. Okay, so um, that is for the NOI piece of it, um, and then but we're going to still do the restoration piece tonight, I assume. Yes, please. Yes, please. Sure. It's uh, you, the spot on the agenda. Yes. Yeah. You guys, let's, we might as well just talk about it as long as everybody's here. Let's uh, just, yeah. just deal let's with it right on. now. Oh, great. Um, uh, Meredith is the, uh, uh, Meredith um, did the restoration plan. And if she could present that, that would be excellent. Okay, can I share my screen to show you guys the map? Yes, you should be able to. Okay, thank you. So good evening, everyone. I know you guys have a long night ahead of you, so I'll try to be as quickly as possible. Um, I can't remember where we left off, but we basically have an updated map and restoration plan per our conversation with Natural Heritage and um, Aaron. And that was, oh my God, months ago by now. So let me just sh share the most recent plan. Um, it just had some minor tweaks from when I sent it out in March. Um, where did it, sorry. A second, not seeing it all of a sudden here. We have copies on our side too, Meredith, if you'd rather have one of us share. Oh, of the map I sent tonight, earlier yeah. today, I mean. Oh, here it is. Can you guys see that? Yes. Okay. So I, so just to reorient you, um, we're on Pomeroy Lane, 214 Pomeroy over here. Um, this was the site that the BBW was cleared, um, a former farm, but well over five years ago. So it was no longer exempt. Um, so where we're at now is restoring BBW along the Eastern and Northern um, edges of the field. 
And the site is also mapped by natural heritage and there's a riverfront area because Plum Brook is down here on the um, Southwest. So our plan is to revegetate the BBW um, and I can go over the plants and we wanna do that this year by June 15th is the deadline I'm proposing. Um, and then we are also going to revegetate the riverfront area because part of that was mown as well with obviously different types of plants that are do better in um, upland soils over there. But that, all, that area is also overlapped by natural heritage. So we have to plant that zone sooner. Um, and they would like us to do it by May 15th because after that, the turtles um, start nesting up there. Um, in theory, we haven't had a turtle biologist out there to tell us that, but it, that's why it's mapped. Um, so, so our plan right now, if we get approval tonight, we're gonna move forward. First, we're gonna get the, um, all the zones staked by the surveyor, and then the planting will occur. And that's gonna be monitored by David also upon your approval, because I won't be able to be out there during the week. And I assume that the plantings will happen during the weekdays. Um, and we're also going to monument the wetland line, permanently monument the wetland lines with um, stakes, rebar, so if the stakes ever um, decompose, the rebar will be present forever and also bird boxes. And we have a fancy little key here, which may be a little bit tricky to read, but I can um, explain it. It's gonna be, actually it's going to be posts and, and the rebar. Uh, and some of the, a few of them will have the bird boxes on it. We've cut that down because we found out the the bluebirds don't like to be very close together and they like to be more spread out. And we had too many bird boxes and it was just gonna cause a fight in the neighborhood. Yeah, yes, thank you. Um, and so the little green dots represent bird boxes. And then, and that's along the BVW line. Um, I think the flags are about 30 feet apart, more or less, and if they, so we're gonna monument every flag. And then if they're more than 30 feet apart, we're also gonna put a post. Um, am I saying that correctly, David? Basically, we've we've shown all the posts we're gonna put in. There's a there's a couple, we, we've, it stretches a little bit. There was gonna to be too many posts. So, I mean, this they're basically 30 feet apart and we fill in any big gaps with an, an extra one. And the rebar, the, the posts are gonna be, are gonna be four inch posts. We'd like to have it four inch, it, either square or round, but because uh, of the ease of installation uh, and the posts are gonna be in front of the rebar, there's gonna be rebar at every flag and a, and a post in front of it or adjacent to it in front of it with a marker on it about uh, not mowing beyond it. And then uh, there'll be a, a couple of interim posts that don't, uh, that weren't wetland flags, but are on the line. So, prevent intrusion into the wetland area. And that's, yes, that's that's Meredith's plan. And I will just say, so in the riverfront area, we're proposing to plant 215 shrubs. Those will be um, low bush blue, blue, blueberry, huckleberry, and sweet fern. Um, we also chose those plants because we hope the turtles will like, like that. Um, the low hanging fruit of the blueberries and potentially huckleberries. And then in the BVW areas, we're going to plant, um, what I say? Every, averaging every eight feet on center, um, we're gonna have dogwood, silky dogwood, high bush blueberry and um, winterberry, Ilex verticillata. Um, we, Again, we're going to have a monitor out there. So whoever is doing the planting is going to guide the landscapers to um, make it look like a wetland. So we don't have plants in rows. It's not meant to be farmed. Um, it's meant to restore the wetlands. So we're, we did provide a conceptual plan that I can share, but basically the shrubs are going to be clumped, but scattered throughout the wetland. So again, meant to look like a wetland, not a, f a place we're farming. Um, is going to take place. 
What else, Dave? Am I? Yeah, the um, the timelines. I mean, the May fifteenth to to plant the the uh, riverfront area so we avoid uh, the nesting of the turtles. June fi June fifteenth for the wetland area. The staking is supposed to be done by April thirtieth. Uh, we've talked to the surveyor and they're running into a little bit of a time problem there. So we've, we've got it. So we'll definitely do the, the riverfront area staking by April 30th and the rest of the staking will be done by May 7th, if that is okay with the commission. That was just a, we're trying to work scheduling and get everybody on track in the, in the right order. Also, uh, since, since this work will probably be done during the, the week. Meredith, since she works three other jobs, uh, will not be available to supervise the replication or the restoration and um, has put me forward, forth as, as an alternative. Um, uh, I have had a little bit of experience doing this, actually quite a bit. Um, and uh, I would like the commission to uh, Hopefully, approve me as a as a person to supervise the restoration, if that's appropriate. Okay, thank you. A little bit about my history. I've I've been doing this for forty years, and I've done um, several hundreds, if not a thousand, uh, wetland replication, either uh, proposals or or supervising involved with. Um, I, if you ever look at the uh, uh, Cumberland Farms at four, Five Corners in, in Granby, there's a there's a one acre swamp out in back of it that we constructed in 1983. So it looks pretty pretty wet. It's also a potential. It's certified or a potential for an old pool back there mapped. But anyway, uh, but thank you for considering me. <laughs> thank you, David, and thank you, Meredith. Uh, Aaron, do you have anything to kick us off on this? Um, well, I just want to say that I, I have reviewed all of the revisions and the requests that they have made. And just from my perspective, um, I really feel that they've done a fantastic job to incorporate all of my feedback, all of Rebecca's requirements. Um, I think that the plan looks very good. Um, I think it's improved dramatically from the first draft that we saw. And um, I am in favor of the board approving this so that we can move forward with the restoration as soon as possible. Thank you, Aaron. Yeah, and just one comment to add, um, and I apologize if you already mentioned this, uh, Meredith, that there's gonna be a wetland seed mix that's gonna be planted interspersed with all of the other plantings that you guys are gonna be doing. So- Yeah, believe... sorry to mention that. We're proposing the New England wet mix in the wetlands, and then in the riverfront area, um, Conservation. Cons uh, yeah, the conservation mix because it's a little bit drier over there. Makes sense. Yeah, and that's a, it's it is important to get the seeding done, you know, by the by June, but the sooner the better, and, and hopefully we'll get some rain. That that upland that conservation seed mix is also an excellent mix. I can't remember exactly what it's in, but it's also a good food source for the turtle. Um, it, and one of the reasons we selected it has species in there that good for that. And can you also just um, really briefly recap the um, the plan for monitoring? I think it was a two year plan. The long term monitoring is proposed in the written restoration plan. Um, we were proposing two years of monitoring. So plots in the BBWs um, areas and a vegetative assessment in the riverfront area. We weren't gonna, let me see, is that right? And then with a report to the commission by November 30th of each year. And I did break the caveat that if it's not doing well, um, you know, more monitoring will, will be required and, and maybe more plants or seeding. Um, it's a type of thing. We're just gonna have to see how it does. And two years is the minimum. Um, so that's what we're going with for now, but there very well likely be um, more monitoring after those two years, but hopefully it will do okay. okay. Excellent, thank you. So comments from commissioners. 
we've been seeing this one for a while. So it's definitely <laughs> evolved a lot. And so thank you um, yeah, for everything that's happened here. Comments or questions from the general public? You can raise your hand virtually. Okay, not hearing any. Um, Aaron, do you have a motion um, draft that we can look at? So thank you. Down at the bottom of the slide. So looking for a motion. I move to approve the revised restoration plan provided today for 20, uh, 1421, 4214 Pomeroy Lane. Thank you, Leroy. Looking for a second. 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 Okay, so looking for a voice vote. Fletcher. Aye. Larry. Aye. Leroy. Aye. Anna. Aye. Laura. Aye. Jen. Aye. And I from me as well. So thank you all very much. And I think we're good with this and we will see you in a couple of weeks. Great, thanks. And we'll keep you posted on the steps as we go forward. Thanks everybody, have a good night. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you guys. Bye, bye Bye. Okay, so we are moving forth. Um, so we are on the notice of intents for Tofino. And so these are all being requested for continuation. Um, can you just, I assume that nobody is here for these, but Aaron, can you just update us on the reasoning and what we can expect? Yeah, um, it was just, it's been an unusually dry spring. Um, and uh, just speaking with Art, he had concerns about um, getting out there to look at the, the high water line when it had been drier than usual conditions. And I checked in with Jen and we agreed that we wanted to try to push that to the end of um, April to see how the rain conditions improve. And um, I spoke with Ted Parker, he was totally fine with that, confirmed in writing that that was fine with him. And Aaron, since we emailed, it looks like the long-term forecast is stacking up to get wetter over the next couple of weeks. So. Um, and I'm sure Art has his eye on it, but maybe not next week, but the week after might be great timing. Sounds good. Might even get some snow coming up. So exciting. Snow melts, thankfully. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so anybody have any questions or comments on this one? Okay, so- Just, Sorry, real briefly. So Art's gonna be doing a whole, a new delineation. He's just, he's doing a peer review of the um, the vernal pool boundary, but it Got needs it. to be a little wetter to confirm that boundary. Yep. Yep. No, I remember. It's just been, there's been a lot on this one. I kind of forgot. Yeah. Okay. Got it. It's been going on for almost two years. <laughs> right. I just had it up. I was like, uh, right. I remember now. Thank you. And then we had other Tofino stuff for, yeah, stuff down there before us before that too. So. Okay. Um, so looking for a motion and this will cover all of the lots in a single motion. All right, so I move to continue Tofino and Associates uh, Inc. hearings for lots one, two, five, six, seven, and eight, all of the lots to uh, April 28th at 7.35 p.m. Second. Thanks, Larry. Okay, thank you both. Fletcher? Aye. Anna? Aye. Larry? Aye. Laura? Abstain. Jen. Aye. Leroy. Aye. And I from me as well. Okay, so that pushes us well into our agenda. So we are now, um, yeah, so we're well past time. So we can start the next one without any issues. Okay, so um, let me get my paperwork out. And this is going to be for um, Levesque Associates. And this public hearing is now called to order. This hearing is being held as required by the provisions of chapter 131, section 40 of the general laws of the Commonwealth. And protecting wetlands as most, most recently amended and, and article 3.31, wetlands protection under the town of Amherst general bylaws. This is for our Levesque Associates, for Todd Alexander, Alexander, Central Amherst Realty LLC for repaving of an existing parking lot, driving aisles, and curbing improvements within the buffer zone of 
an intermittent stream located at 33 to 37 and 51 East Pleasant Street, map 11C, parcels 267, 268, 270, 272, and 273. So welcome. Um, and so Todd, uh, I assume that you'll be presenting and if you can introduce yourself and give us a background on the project, please. Hello everyone, this is, this is Ryan Nelson from R. Levesque Associates. Um, I guess I'll be kicking things off here. Todd, I think is on the call with us. Uh, maybe he'll speak in a moment. Um, but as you may know, this site is the former Bertucci's restaurant building uh, located here at the corner of Triangle Street and East Pleasant Street. Um, currently the parking lot is, you know, not in the best shape and definitely needs some repaving and uh, work for the new tenant going into the building. So as you can see, this existing parking lot shown here in blue and red, um, we divide it into two sections for kind of two different repaving activities to occur. The first being the red hatched section. It's about 5,100 square feet. Um, that pavement is going to be removed. And then also the base is gonna be removed to about excavated to about eight inches deep. A new gravel base will be installed and compacted with a binder course and then a final top coat of asphalt. And then the blue areas that you see uh, just under 25,000 square feet will be um, repaved so that there's proper drainage going to the existing catch basins located within the parking lot. Uh, the reason why we're before you tonight is this work is within the buffer zone to an intermittent stream located here. Uh, there's a culvert outfall, a head wall located right here. The stream flows this way in this direction uh, before going into another culvert that eventually confluences with the Tanbrook conduit that traverses the property. That's a subsurface uh, piping uh, that these catch basins and this offsite culvert and stream ultimately lead to. Um, as part of this project, there is also some invasive species located along the bank of this stream. It's mostly or pretty much all Japanese knotweed. So as part of this project, we're proposing to remove Japanese knotweed by hand. It would be cut during the summer months um, and recut as needed throughout the summer months as new shoots uh, try to grow back. The cuttings would be immediately placed into uh, bags and then removed off site and disposed of properly in a landfill and not some other site where they could spread. And then we're recommending towards the end of the summer or just an early fall that those cut stems be um, spot treated with an approved herbicide by the commission um, by a licensed applicator. Once the invasive plant species are removed, we then have proposed plantings along this uh, bank to provide shade for the stream. Um, the species we have selected are maple leaf viburnum, service berry, also shad bush, I think some people call it, and then paper birch saplings. All are about two to three or three to four feet in height, um, scattered along the bank, along that stream from culvert to culvert. Um, aside from that, there's no new point source discharge for stormwater. We're not increasing impervious. We're simply just repaving the existing parking lot. Um, and we're also going to be installing a new curb line along this easterly border of the parking area shown here, this dark and blue line. Um, the existing curb will be left in place. We're simply just gonna be constructing a new curb immediately adjacent in front of it on the interior side of the parking. So our goal is not to disturb any soil uh, on the site or beyond the limits of this parking area. Um, I think that highlights all the key points. Um, if Todd wants to chime in, otherwise we're happy to answer any questions from the commission. Thank you, Ryan. Todd, do you have anything you'd like to add at this point? Uh, no, I think Ryan covered everything in great detail. Um, this is uh, a project that I'm sure you all recall. We uh, kind of uh, jumped the gun prematurely on this in December 
um, not, and this is um, my first experience with a conservation commission, uh, not realizing the steps that we had to take here. And uh, we apologize. I take full responsibility for that, but we want to do right by this and, and uh, obviously have this taken care of uh, in all the right manner. So uh, we're here to work with you and hopefully um, we can get this achieved. The, the, the parking lot, uh, hopefully some of you have had a chance to take a look at it. It is in, um, it's in really rough shape. Uh, Bertucci's was a tenant for 20 years there. Per their lease, they were supposed to maintain the parking lot uh, over the last many number of years, didn't do anything to it. Um, we do have a new tenant that's coming in that we're very excited about. They're going to be putting a lot of improvements into the exterior of the property we, uh, as far as the building goes. And we just want to make sure that the, the parking lot and surrounding areas uh, are going to uh, show nicely as well. Great. Thank you, Todd. Erin? So I'm just going to flip through some photos. I'm sure you guys are familiar with the site. This is the area of Japanese knotweed along the stream. This is the stream itself. The parking lot, just to show the condition of the parking lot, there's two existing catch basins on the site that are currently protected. And then the portion that was um, patched just to protect it over the winter, you can see there. Um, I did send a pretty long list of condition or uh, questions to um, to Ryan yesterday, um, and he spun these around really fast. Which thank you, Ryan, because I'm playing major catch up right now, and so um, is the turnaround was really appreciated. Um, basically, my my comments were um, this this site is not subject to um, stormwater redevelopment um, under the uh, regulations because they aren't expanding impervious and they're not adding any point source discharge, but they did provide an, uh, at my request an operation and maintenance plan, a long-term operation and maintenance plan for the management of the parking area and the um, catch basins anyways, which is great. So that means that um, those areas will be monitored. Um, they also included a great deal more specificity with regard to the invasive species removal um, that I had requested. And so th that's what those revised documents were that I forwarded you today that included that greater amount of detail, um, particularly about how the material was going to be removed, how it was going to be disposed of, and how the area was going to be um, replanted. I didn't want it to turn into just a landscaped area that was made to look pretty with non-natives. The whole idea is for it to be restoring the bank of the stream. Um, and additional details with regard to the treatment, when it was gonna be treated, um, the time of year it was gonna be treated, how it was gonna be treated and how long the treatment was going to be for. So um, all those details are now included in the materials, which I am satisfied with after reviewing them and um, that trash will be cleaned up out of that stream on a regular basis. Um, they said on a weekly basis in their application and there was one error in the application which was revised. So um, based on that, um, I felt like all of my comments were addressed. Um, and again, these were all my comments. There was no comments from Jason Skeels. Um, I asked him about the condition of the catch basins and he said that he thought that they were in adequate condition. Um, and so based on that, uh, these are my uh, recommendations um, and that um, approval include the revised plans that were provided today. Excellent, thank you, Erin. And so Erin, is this indeed intermittent? And it probably has to do with just the catchment area. I know we've had issues depending on where on Tanbrook we've measured from. Yes, so Tanbrook only becomes perennial um, after it enters the um, culvert that goes under um, Mass Ave. Oh, all the way over there, okay. Yeah, yeah, before that it's intermittent the whole way. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and this is definitely a sad little stream there. And so yeah, anything we can do uh, to help improve that would be, would be great. Any comments or questions from the commissioners? I just want sounds like you guys are going to be getting a um, license applicator anyway, but um, I find the best luck with knotweed is 
if you cut it now, it'll obviously re-sprout, but the best way to hit it is with um, when it flowers in the fall or late late summer in the in fall. But I'm sure the licensed applicator will know that and um, be the um, will operate it the proper way. But you're going to have to do it a couple years and maybe more than two to really knock that stuff back. So. Um, one, one, one other suggestion might be to also, I know this is a really small area, you're putting in the viburnum, paper birch and something else, service berry, but maybe some types of other shrubs in there might, might be advantageous, but as a, like we were talking about in the Fearing Brook, it's, it's an iffy spot, but um, really just a comment. Yeah, and then to build off of that, just to make sure that the, and the applicant did mention it, but to make sure that the chemicals that are used are approved for wetlands, which I'm sure they would be. But I'm sorry. Yeah, they, they totally, rodeo. So, so, and I'll just jump in here. So, so Fletcher, that was, that was one of my comments was that the treatment should be done in the fall. Um, yeah. And um, that uh, the, the licensed applicator has to provide their name and contact information to us and that whatever they're using for treatment by us as a um, wetland friendly, um, wetland approved. Yeah. Chemical. And then also um, they, I, they did put in the management plan, I believe for two years of treatment. Ryan, correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought that's what I remember reading in the revision. Um, I'm in a little trouble hearing you, but I, two, was it two years you had mentioned? Yes. Uh, yes, that's correct. At least, yeah, as uh, Fletcher stated, it would probably take a couple of years of treatment. Yeah. If, yeah, if you guys can go to four years or something, that'd be sweet, just so you don't lose out on what you plant there. But, you know, I understand also the area you're working in, and it's a pretty beat up area. So. <laughs> okay. So hopefully, no wood turtles in there. <laughs> I should. Yeah, just a couple of beavers, Fletcher. That's all. So, um, so any other comments from any other commissioners on this? Yeah, I mean they're primarily you know putting in what was there before and yeah making some much needed improvements. Any comments or questions from the general public on this one? Okay, so not hearing any. Um, Aaron, can we see that motion sheet again? Thank you. Yeah, so and for whatever reason, I missed two of the motions on my on my sheet, and this is one of them, but um, I will just write in the DEP file number. It's 89-682. Um, and as long as you guys um, uh, motion to approve the revised documents that were provided to me today, um, it's gonna capture all of the details that we discussed. And then the state and boilerplate conditions should also be included. Okay, sounds good. Okay, looking for a motion. So I move to accept the uh, revised um, NOI or eight nine six eight two, and make sure um, erosion controls are installed within the limits of work. There's going to be straw bales, silt fence, and we're going to have our state and local boilerplate conditions in there as well. The planting plan and the invasive management plan. Am I missing anything else? Very good. Seconded, Fletcher. Seconded. Thank you. Looking for a voice vote, Leroy. Aye. Laura. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Larry. Aye. Anna. Aye. Jen. Aye. And I from me as well. So thank you both. And you'll be receiving paperwork from Aaron uh, in the near future. Hey, real quick, guys. Can I ask what? who's what's going in there? Uh so it's um <laughs> I guess it I can mention you it. You don't now. have it's, to tell me. I'll it's it's sorry, it's the uh, Frontera Grill group. Uh, it's a Mexican restaurant chain. Um, they're going to be calling this location uh, Gar Garcia's Mexican restaurant. All right. Sweet. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank, thank you. Everyone. Thank you all very much. Okay.
So we are going to move on to our next uh, item on our agenda, which is a request for determination. So let me make sure I have my right sheet here. Nope, not that one. Okay, here we go. This public meeting is now called to order. This meeting is being held by required by the provisions of chapter 131, section 40 of the general laws of the Commonwealth and act relative to the protections of wetlands as most recently amended in article 3.31, wetlands protection under the town of Amherst general bylaws. This is for Cold Spring Environmental for Molly and Brian McLaughlin to determine whether proposed work is subject to jurisdiction under the State Wetlands Protection Act and whether the work in area are subject to jurisdiction under Article 3.31, Wetlands Protection under the Town of Amherst General Bylaws at Flat Hills Road, Map 9A, Parcel 30. And so it uh, looks like we have a couple of people here for this one. So uh, whoever would like to um, kick us off, if you can introduce yourself and your relationship to the project, and then give us a little bit of background, please. I guess I'll start. Alan Weiss, Cold Spring Environmental consultants in Belchertown. Um, I was uh, tasked by the owners of the property and integrity uh, builders to put together a plan for a septic system here. Um, I had also done some work here in the past for the prior owner. And so I was familiar with the property, but in a nutshell, we are building a single family house on the um, most Northern and Eastern corner of the lot, which puts all the work that is proposed out of the buffer zone of the resource area. Mm -hmm. um, I can certainly answer a lot more questions about it, but this dwelling, the well, the septic system, the water line, all work seems to be out of the buffer. Either Alan or Aaron, could one of you just put up the site map real quick? Yes, I can grab it. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. That'll be quicker. <laughs> okay. Anything else from you, Ellen? Or? I have it too, if, if I can share. Yeah. I mean, what I did find is as you go down slope to the west of where the proposed work is, there is a very um, small, um, I'm, I'm going to call it an intermittent stream, but at, at some point the, it, there were points where the, the channel was really difficult to find, but um, you certainly wouldn't find it right now, but you might find something in a few days after the next precip event. Um, uh, the, I looked at it both when the site was snow covered and when it was free of snow. Um, I think the mapping is probably on the conservative side, but I'm comfortable with that. And it still leaves plenty of room for the larger brook and resource area farther to the west and south. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you. And so I don't know if there's anybody else, uh, if Anna or somebody else on the applicant side has anything else they wanna add? I'm here, but I have nothing else to add beyond that. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you. So Erin? Yeah, so um, I went out and walked the site and um, my observations were that the, the site is entirely upland and that all of the work proposed is outside of jurisdiction. I think um, Stephanie erred on the side of caution with this one. Um, and, you know, that's, that is the way to go. Um, I reviewed it and walked the site. And I think I would recommend to the board that they issue a negative determination of applicability checking box number one, which uh, indicates that the request is not subject to protection under the act or the buffer zone. And um, it's also not subject under our local bylaw. Excellent. Thank you, Aaron. Any comments or questions from the commission? This one seems pretty straightforward. I'll just add one more thing, if I could, um, that the Board of Health, as far as I know, has approved the septic system and the well locations as designed. They have, yes. Uh, if there's anybody from the public who would like to make any comments, you can use the raise hand feature. Okay, not hearing any, looking for a motion. Make the motion. Um, motion uh, for Flat Hill Roads um, to issue a negative determination of applicability that the site described in the request is not an area subject to protection under, under um, and, uh, actually under our jurisdiction. 
Thank you. Okay. All. Oh, Thank sorry. You. Okay. Um, so voice vote, Leroy. Aye. Anna. Aye. Laura. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Larry. Aye. Jen. Aye. And I for me as well. So thank you, Alan, and thank you, Anna. Thank you so much. Thank you. Be well. You as well. Okay. So we are moving on down the line, and this is actually the last piece of the main agenda that we have. So Aaron, this is a request for an amended order of condition. So how do we, is there something special we have to do to open this? Um, no, I mean, we're, we're reopening the public hearing for DEP number 89675 um, to incorporate some modifications to the order of conditions. But it's, it's it's just like it's just like opening the original order of conditions, but it's just we're amending the original. Okay, I just want to make sure that we get all the legal pieces right. So okay, so if there is nothing formal I need to say, then this is now officially reopened. Uh, and if there is anybody here from the applicants, uh, just raise your hand. Panelist. Okay, so I think we are good to go. And so whichever of the applicants would like to present, if you could introduce yourself and then introduce the project as well, please. Good evening. Uh, my name is Simon Hilt. I'm representing Eversource Energy. Uh, I believe we also have Steve Letko from GZA, who's our wetlands consultant, uh, should be on the line here. Mm -hmm. no, he's... Yes, we do have him and Jonathan Roberge as All right. well. Okay, so Simon, do you want to um, give a background on what's going on here? Sure, I can. Um, just to, to sum things up, um, essentially what's going on here is in the original notice of intent that was filed before the commission uh, last August, I believe, uh, there were a number of different activities that were presented uh, include, uh, related to the replacement of structures along the Montague to Fairmont transmission lines. Um, and essentially what happened was uh, there were impacts that were presented in the, or alterations I should say, that were presented in the original notice of intent uh, that were not uh, reported on the NOI form three and then subsequently were not reflected on the form five. Um, so in general, this relates to the tree removals that we have in both uh, BVW and Riverfront area. Um, as well as uh, one area, I believe, where we had a, some proposed temporary alterations associated with building a gravel work pad in Riverfront area that we were going to restore. So the gist of, uh, of uh, item one there is just basically to get the, the alteration numbers that were presented uh, both in that August NOI and the subsequent October um, amend, uh, uh, administrative change request there. Uh, which uh, extended the limits of tree removals a bit there uh, to get those reflected on a form five so that uh, basically we have a, a permit that reflects all the alterations that we presented previously and were reviewed and approved um, so that we're covered there. Um, the other pieces of this are just to basically um, through our, our dealings with MassDEP, we're, we're applying for a 401 water quality cert for the project for portions of the project and um, through their, their review of the project, um, they they were looking at the orders of conditions that we received from the different towns and uh, in several of the towns, because it's similar to Amherst here. Everybody else hear that? Yes. <laughs> okay. Not sure what that is. That's fun. Um, so in several towns, including Amherst, uh, the wow. mitigation consisted of um, compensation essentially to fund uh, mitigation projects that the, that the town or the CONCOM would actually implement themselves. Uh, being that number of those projects won't come to fruition until the time where we need our 401 water quality certification, uh, DEP felt that they, they wanted to make sure that um, the impairment or any alterations um, associated with tree removals were covered in some way that they could you know, see as tangible. Um, so we're working with them through the 401 water quality uh, process to uh, determine some additional mitigation actions um, 
couple of things that we're looking at are with uh, with Kestrel Land Trust, where they have projects that they're basically going to be uh, we're going to be assisting with placing some conservation restrictions on parcels is uh, is likely what we're going to be doing there, uh, and also a stream crossing improvement project down in Granby is another piece of the pie. Um, so in in our discussions with the EP, they suggested that we discuss this with you and just um, allow or provide the option for you guys to just memorialize the the fact that we are in addition to what we've already provided to the town we're, we're pursuing some additional mitigation with the ep the third piece of the uh, of the request here is associated with uh, some uh, uh, revisions to the wetland delineations that were presented in the original noi um, we do have map sheets that were included in in the uh, request here essentially in the springtime when uh, GZA went back out to refresh flagging to make sure that everything was up and visible before we started construction uh, it was determined in two locations I believe that there were uh, small intermittent channels within the limits of BBW um, and, and a couple of spots where or at least one spot where we found some some BBW that hadn't been determined here first so the, the slide that uh, I think Aaron has up here basically shows um, a section on uh, a tap line that runs off of the main transmission line to the Podic substation along Route 116 near, near Bubs there. Uh, and at this one work pad uh, at structure 14147, you can see the smaller inset that says portion from original NOI. We're proposing an entire uh, gravel pad there that was just basically the corner was shaved off at the limit of riverfront area. Uh, during this uh, flagging refresh activity, uh, the wetland uh, marked as wetland 174, um, just to the south of that work pad was identified, which did cast a uh, 100 foot buffer over a portion of the work pad and also the local 25 foot buffer over the portion of the work pad. So we have converted that uh, work pad to matting. So there won't be grading within buffer zone or the 25 foot there, as you can see in the area with update. So the section that you're hovering over there, Aaron, that was originally um, a, an alternative access that we were pursuing to try to avoid um, having gravel access road constructed within riverfront area. We were not able to uh, obtain rights for that off right, right away access. So ultimately the, um, the piece that you see there in the red and white there is the gravel access that we uh, that was approved previously. Um, actually, while we're on this this section right here, the work pad at structure 14148 uh, is is a, an area that's going to be restored uh, because of the slope that's there now. Uh, we needed to do some grading there to create a safe and level work pad. Uh, but being that that is within the riverfront area, uh, that will be restored. And so in the original NOI, uh, what happened was basically just the, the permanent gravel alterations were reflected as the alteration, whereas this area will be temporarily altered and temporarily altered rather and, and then restored. So we didn't we didn't present the, the complete alteration there, just just the permanent alteration. So that's what the uh, the numbers in our amended uh, requests reflect there. They include the also the temporary alteration as well as the permanent. Uh, Aaron, if you could slide down to the next sheet there. Um, so here we are closer to the Podic substation along Route 116. Um, you can see in the original section there, there was not an intermittent channel. In the updated section, it was determined that in this marshy area, there is a small channel. So we've added that into the, the mapping here. And what that means for us is it, it just made us aware that we have a section of the access matting where we need to make sure we span the banks of the stream. Uh, so we're not obstructing flow or impacting the bank. Uh, it doesn't alter the limits of uh, buffer zone or the 25 foot there. So it's, it's essentially just a note for us to um, make sure that we're spanning it and also to bring it to your attention. Next, if you could. Um, Steve, I don't know if you can speak to, there are a couple of sheets that don't have the insets here, which I don't recall why they were included in the, uh, in the request here. Steve, do you, do you have that? Yeah, so um, what we did was we included a few sheets here with call outs for impacts within uh, bordering land subject to flooding. Um, there's no new activity here, but we, we just wanted to call out the tree removal in BLSF because that also needs to be included on the form. Um, so there's no new activity here. It's just that we included a call out and in the original NOI, we did not have a call out. So we just wanted to do this for informational purposes just to show that, you know, just to make it clear on the plan. Okay. 
And same here. Same here as well? Yes. Uh, on this sheet, you can see a similar situation to near Podic substation there where we, we determined there was another channel. So we've added that in there. Uh, we don't have that span symbol on this one, but noting that it is on the on the plan there, we, we have the call out that indicates that the uh, the contractor does need to span the channels there. So they'll place the mats for the work pad in a, in a way manner that uh, does bridge the, uh, the banks there. That's another tree removal in BLSF. Right. And here uh, along Bay Road, uh, you can see the original NOI, um, the, the BBW stopped uh, right around structure 10220. Uh, upon refreshing, this is, this is an area that's uh, a wet meadow. So um, upon uh, revisiting the area, it was determined that the BBW did extend. We were planning to map through this area anyway, so it doesn't change the, the work methods that we we're proposing, but it does uh, mean that we do have some additional 25 foot on there that we will be matting through. I, so I, don't know if the, I don't know if the commission wants to go through each and every one of these or just kind of wants to get a gist um, of the adjustments where changes were made. Just we can go through them all if you guys want to. No, thank you, Aaron. I think it yeah, highlights would be fine. Yeah. So I'll I'll stop there for now, unless there's more that you guys want to specifically highlight. I, I think those those are the uh, those are the highlights. I don't think there's anything significant okay. beyond. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So anything else from the applicant? Um. Well, the project, I would just note that, uh, you know, as you are probably aware, the project does run from Montague, the Montague substation, down to our Fairmont substation in Chicopee. Um, the, the first phases of the project are underway. Uh, civil construction has already commenced in Montague and Leverett. Uh, and we're definitely, um, the, the project is driven by the, the schedule that we have for taking, there, there are two electrical circuits being uh, supported by these transmission poles, uh, or structures rather. And um, basically, we have to take, take the, each one out of service in, in uh, uh, staggered, basically, so that uh, we, we're allowed to do the work there. And, and the, the schedule is, is quite strict as far as when we're allowed to do that. Uh, it's, it's set in stone. So um, that's all. I just want to put that back out there and just say that we're, we're, we're eager to commence work uh, in Amherst uh, when we can, um, provided we have a, a valid order of conditions here, of course. Um, one, one question that I would like to ask since I'm, I'm going on here is um, if we are to receive the amended order we're seeking here, um, I expect that there would still, there would be an appeal period associated with that or would there not, do you know? It will, yeah, because I think the whole reason that DEP wanted this issued was to be able to have the opportunity to appeal if they wanted to, okay. um, to the additional numbers. Um, from my perspective, you guys could proceed with the work that was already already approved. Um, okay. So I, you know, I don't have a problem with that. And again, you know, the from from where I sit, basically all the work has already been approved. Um, that the the changes were um, where there's like these additional areas that you've highlighted where there were changes. So. Um, I would say use your best judgment as far as if you think that DEP is going to be <laughs> appealing here. No, no, we, we've we've been working uh, quite closely. We had um, some some very good recent uh, hours on uh, Zoom with with David Fowlis, and so we're we're definitely working together with them. And and one thing that they did make very clear is that they they do not intend to interfere with any of the orders of conditions. We do have a similar situation in in Montague that we need to correct. Uh, so they they understand that you know the conditions are the orders of the conditions are final. Um, so we, we don't expect that they're going to appeal. And just, just I know that the commission's already aware of this, but just so that, so that the commission knows that in addition to the $37,000 that we got from Eversource for basically open-ended mitigation projects in town, we also have a number of specific site related mitigation projects that Eversource spearheaded um, as part of this project, like the Amethyst Brook um, Bank Restoration Project is one of those specific sites. Um, the 
the um, Podic conservation area or Zala conservation area where we're, they're actually doing a, um, a wet, they're creating a wetland out there um, and beaver removal at Pomeroy Court. So we have, we, we really thoroughly, thoroughly, I think got our mitigation um, for the town of Amherst for this project. And um, a lot of the numbers were <laughs> the alteration numbers that are being incorporated into the amended order were actually not necessarily um, a, a permanent alteration to a wetland that's being accounted for, but rather tree clearing in a wetland. So it's like a conversion of a forested wetland to a non-forested wetland for the sake of the right of way safety. So just to kind of point that out as to what some of these numbers, the changes are actually showing on the form. And, and, and the numbers that are shown on the form are, I mean, the commission has, you've already approved those last last fall. It's just that the numbers never got on the form in the proper way. You approve the plans, you approve the, the narrative and the table. They show right. the numbers, but it, they just never made it to the form. And, it, you know, according to, to Dave Files, it has, you know, from DEP, it has to be on the form. The, the tree clearing was approved. It just wasn't it wasn't indicated as a permanent alteration of the wetland on the form. It was accounted for as a temporary alteration um, in the paperwork that was submitted with the application. So that's one of the, the updates that they're revising this form for. Correct. To include that. And that's, that's not necessarily consistent across um, DEP regions that they would require that. So, but I guess, I guess that's, that's, that's something that, that, um, they wanted to do here. So, and that's completely fine. It's just, that's why they're bringing it forward. Okay, thank you, Erin. So uh, any comments or questions from the commission? Uh, anybody from the general public? I think we're kind of getting late in the evening at this point. Okay, looking for a motion then. I move to issue the amended order of conditions to DP file number 0890675 uh, to approve of the following changes. Correct WPA form five to reflect complete aerial extent. Yep. Aerial extent of alterations presented in August 11, 2020 notice of intent package filed by GZA for the project and subsequent correspondent. Correspondence dated October 26, 2020. To memorialize that Eversource is working with Mass DEP to offset any functional loss of wetlands related to the tree removals through a collaborative mitigation project and to obtain the Commission's final approval of updated map sheets related to several revisions in, of the, to the delineation of resource areas within the project corridor. All other conditions from the original approval will still apply. Thank you, Leroy. Looking Second. Yes, thank you. Sure. So voice vote. Uh, Fletcher. Aye. Leroy. Aye. Anna. Aye. Larry. Aye. Jen, if you're still awake. Aye. Hi, hey, I'm awake. <laughs> <laughs> this is riveting. That's past your bedtime, I thought. It is. <laughs> so. Me too. Oh, I'm sorry, Laura? Oh, maybe it is past Laura's Aye. bedtime. Aye. Aye. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so thank you, everyone. So we are good here, and you'll be hearing from Aaron soon. Yeah, and I'll try to get that. I'll try to get that to you guys as soon as possible. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you very much. Good night. Bye. -bye. So is the last thing that we need to cover tonight, Aaron, the emergency cert? No. Um, so just to, just to give you a quick update, we got two requests for emergency certifications. Um, both were basically denied. Um, one of them, we already received an RDA for the work, which is going to be um, reviewed on the um, April 28th meeting. The other um, denial there, the, I'm encouraging the applicant to file to get the work done. Um, but yeah, I mean, I could, it, it's for the, the green leaves and it's an alternate um, 
fire road access where there's a culvert that um, is not functional at this point. And um, they requested an emergency certification from the fire chief and he would not issue it. Um, and we didn't really, you know, it's, it's the road is, the road is um, passable by vehicle and the thought of replacing um, a culvert in a sensitive wetland area when the, it's not like it's washed out or there's any, and it's, a, it's an alternate access. So there's already main access to green leaves on the paved road. This is just a, um, an alternate access on a dirt road. So we just didn't feel that it rose to the occasion of being um, an emergency certification. And so um, they've been urged to file a notice of intent. I haven't yet received it, but um, <laughs> hoping that they will proceed with that. Okay, thank you. So is there anything else, Aaron, or we're all done? I mean, there's a lot more, but those are the main business items that you guys really need to deal with tonight. I'm hoping that um, the next meeting is gonna also be a little bit business heavy as we sort of continue to push through the spring and tie up um, a lot of the business that I pushed off from this meeting because it was such a busy meeting. But um, but we'll do the same thing we did this meeting. We'll power through it and uh, awesome job, guys. Right. Thank you very much, Aaron. And thanks for all your help. Thanks for organizing, Aaron. Yeah, well done. The draft motions, so good. We're all gonna turn into Jen now. We're all ready Perfect. for it. I like that draft agenda. <laughs> well, we need, we need one more motion. So I don't know if Aaron has it drafted for us, but I bet yeah, you Aaron, can do this. Up on the board. <laughs> yeah. I move we adjourn. Thanks, Jen. I second that. Third. I third that. Fletcher? Oh, yeah. I'm in. Aye. 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 Leroy? Aye. Jen? Aye. Larry? Aye. And I heard aye from Laura and aye from myself. So we are officially adjourned. So thank you, everyone. See you in two Thanks, weeks. Good night, everyone. Good night, See you guys. Bye. Good night.